Tuesday, January 18th, 2022, and we are live. Welcome to the African History Network show right here on 9, 10 a.m. The Superstation, uh, the Future Radio. I'm your host, Brother Michael M. Hotel. So Dr. King Day was very interesting. Um, I was scheduled to speak at Davis and Elkins College in West Virginia. So I got up. But well, let me, let me rephrase that. I ain't go to sleep. Uh, I, so I did my show Sunday night. And originally I wasn't scheduled to do uh, my show Sunday night because I was supposed to leave Sunday afternoon. But my flight was uh, canceled because of the weather. So I got my flight rescheduled to leave uh, Monday morning, 9.15 a.m. to head to West Virginia. So um, after I finished my radio show at 11 p.m., on Sunday, I continued to work on the presentation that uh, I was going to deliver. Uh, the name of my presentation is Dr. King's Distorted Legacy, Reckoning with Racial Injustice. Um, we're coming to get our check. Dr. King's Distorted Legacy, Reckoning with Racial Injustice. We're coming to get our check. So I didn't go to bed Sunday night. I worked on my presentation and continue to watch episodes of uh, Eyes on the Prize and because I have it on DVD box set. And I usually watch Eyes on the Prize uh, this time of year because I'm doing presentations of Dr. King and doing shows, uh, episodes of, uh, you know, the radio show. And we're talking about it here on the show. So. Um, so I head to the airport at um, about 620 a.m at a 9, 15 a.m. flight. I wanted to make sure, because, I mean, there have been times when I missed a flight, just to be honest, especially early morning flights. And I said, I'm not missing this flight because the college paid for the airfare. They paid for the hotel. So I said, I'm not missing this flight. So I get to the airport like a good two hours early. And I took a picture of me uh, at Metro Airport, Detroit Metro Airport. And I was um, across from the check-in station for... Um, I was across from the uh, check-in station for United Airlines. So a lot of people saw the picture that I posted and they were commenting on that picture as well. I was tired. I had not been asleep. So I had two flights, one from Detroit to Chicago and then from Chicago to uh, uh, Clarksburg, West Virginia. Okay, so the flight from Detroit to Chicago was fine. And I uh, make my way to... Uh, the gate uh, in Chicago O'Hare Airport, and we're sitting on the plane. And they tell us that there's a delay because the um, airport in Clarksburg is trying to clear the snow off the ground, off the uh, uh, runway, because of the storm that's hitting the East Coast, the winter storm that's hitting the East Coast. So then a few minutes later, they tell us that the flight is canceled because the airport cannot clear the runway. The air, airport where we have to land in Clarksburg, West Virginia, can't clear the airport. So the flight's canceled that I'm sitting on. So then I have to get rebooked on the flight back to Detroit. So I fly standby. Luckily, I was like the last person that they were able to get in on standby to get back to Detroit to get here in time to actually do my presentation virtually at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So I had a hell of a day uh, on uh, Dr. King Day. Okay, but nonetheless, it was a good presentation. And uh, I'm gonna let you hear an excerpt of it as well. All right, so on today's show, there's so much to deal with. And uh, we're gonna talk about these topics uh, all throughout the week as well. So um, there was an article from the Huffington Post that I posted on our Facebook fan page, the African history network and our YouTube channel, Michael M hotel, Nicole Hannah Jones gives 1619 project critics, the MLK tribute they deserve. Nicole Hannah, Hannah Jones, 1619 project, New York times and author of the 1619 project book. So what's rich, it, you know, and I knew different things like this were going to happen. And we're going to talk about Kirsten cinema and, Senator Mitch McConnell tweeting about uh, posting on social media about Dr. King on Dr. King Day. 
I mean, the, the caucasity of this, I mean, they, they would have been better off just not saying anything. But this story right here that, that we're going to discuss today, Nicole Hannah Jones talked about how she was invited uh, on, on Monday. Uh, Dr. King Day, Nicole Hannah Jones, the author of the best selling 1619 project, posted on Twitter, uh, on a Twitter thread, explaining that she was invited to give a speech about Dr. King. But a small number of members of the group hosting her claimed her presence, her presence dishonored the civil rights icon. Some people, I don't know who these people were. I don't know what these people have read about Dr. King. Obviously, you never went, read Where Do We Go From Here, Chaos of Community. Obviously, you don't know Dr. King was the most hated man in America when he was assassinated. Okay. Obviously, you, you never read uh, letters from a Birmingham jail where he talked about the problem with the white moderates. But but you had some you had some people who said that Nicole Hannah Jones presence dishonored Dr. King's uh, dishonored uh, Dr. King. OK, so what she did was she read. Uh, just, uh, speeches from Dr. King and was addressing their issues and concerns but these people thought it was actually her words nicole hannah jones decided the best response would be to quote dr king accurately by reading excerpts of his speeches without mentioning explicitly that they were his words okay she tore she tore their behinds up this is how ignorant many people are first nicole hannah jones said that dr king noted like her that 1619 was the year was the year the first uh, black slaves were brought to America. She also said she purposely used the term black instead of Negro, as was common in Dr. King's time to prevent people from making the connection before her big reveal. We're going to talk about this because one, this, this this deals with you see you see, and I, I do a two and a half hour lecture dealing with the distortion of the legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. The revolutionary would not be televised on the television, all right? Because Dr. King's legacy is distorted. Okay, we'll deal with this on the other side of the break. We're, we're gonna talk about the showdown in the Senate over voting rights. I'm gonna let you hear from Representative James Clyburn who said he's had enough and we have a lot more. I'm Michael M. Hotel. we'll be back in a few minutes. What does self-care mean to you? To us, it's an opportunity to reconnect with nature. A chance to create something remarkable. At Sage and Elm Apothecary, our handcrafted skin care and household products immerse you in Earth's sweetest nectar, connecting you to nature in a way you never imagined. See for yourself and visit us at sageandelmapothecary.com. Mental health and well-being have long been a taboo subject in the so-called African-American community. So I enlisted the help of mental health experts, thought leaders, and activists to help kill the ghost of Willie Lynch and heal from post-traumatic slave syndrome. We experience trauma a lot of times um, on a subconscious level. So sometimes something happens to us and we know that it's traumatizing, but we don't really recognize the extent of the trauma. Welcome back to the African History Network show right here on 910 AM, the Superstation, the Future Radio. I'm your host, Brother Michael M. Hotep. It is Tuesday, January 18th, 2022, and we are live. Calling numbers 313-778-7600. 313-778-7600 is the call-in number if you have a question or comment. Okay, so uh, right before the break, I was telling you uh, what happened on uh, Dr. King Day. And uh, my presentation ended up going well, I ended up doing it virtually. And we were talking about this article here from uh, Huffington Post that deals with the hypocrisy of a lot of ignorant people, almost called them ignorant ass people, but we don't want to do that in the spirit of Dr. King. A, a lot of ignorant people when it comes to uh, Dr. King and his legacy 
And you have these people who uh, really have not studied Dr. King and they're dealing with the uh, Dr. the mascot of Dr. King or as um, as uh, uh, Dr. Cornell West calls it, the Santa Clausification of Dr. King. OK, and they're not dealing with the Dr. King who was anti-poverty, anti-racism, anti-war, who called out America on uh, America's hypocrisy, who was trying to dismantle white supremacy and racism, who called out white moderates. He would call out uh, Joe Manchin. He would call out Kirsten Cinema as well as the 50 Republicans. OK, maybe minus Lisa McCown because she did vote uh, for the John Lewis Voting Rights Act to proceed to a Senate floor debate. But she was the only Republican that did that. So uh, if we uh, go back and look at this uh, piece here from uh, Huffington Post Black Voices, and I posted this on our uh, Facebook fan page, the African History Network. Nicole Hannah Jones gives 1619 Project critics the MLK treatment they deserve. OK, I think some of them deserve the uh, the the uh, Della Reese treatment from Harlem night. <laughs> but <laughs> that's just me. OK, so first, Nicole Hannah Jones said that Dr. King noted like her that this, that 1619 was the year uh, the first African slaves were brought to America. Now, we know we've dealt with this numerous times here on this show and in my classes. This, so you're talking about in the British colonies because the Spanish were bringing Africans into the territory we call South Carolina in 1526. OK, so it's important for people to understand this. But the British colonies, 1619, you're not dealing with the information from Dr. David M. Hotep's book, The First Americans Were Africans, Documented Evidence in the African Presence 51,700 Years Ago. I understand that. So we're dealing with 1619. OK, so that's fine. Uh, she then and here's a tweet from her. Here is some of it. Uh, here's some of what she said. It was in 16 in the year 1619 that the first black was brought to the shores of this nation. Now, at this time, once again, 1619, none of the 13 colonies did they even have codified slave laws. Those first uh, 20 and odd Africans on the white lion pirate ship were put into a form of indentured servitude. And they're going to be released after about three to five years. But I, I understand what you're saying. They were brought here from the soils of Africa. They came from Angola. Um, and unlike the Pilgrim Fathers who landed here at Plymouth in 1620, a year later, they were brought here against their will. Now, she went on to say, wherever you see uh, black in caps, it's because I substituted out Negro to give it uh, to give to not give it away, not give away that she's actually reading the words from Dr. King that most people don't know. Most people haven't read Dr. King's speeches. The only speech they know about many of them is I have a dream, which is originally called normalcy never again. Then it was called a canceled check. Then late years later, it's called I have a dream because the speech was not about a dream. She said for more than 200 years, Africa was raped and plundered a native kingdom disorganized, the people and rulers demoralized and and throughout slavery, the black slaves were treated in a very inhuman form. These are words from Dr. King. This is Dr. King. They don't quote on the television. Now, MSNBC did some good coverage, uh, Mehdi Hassan and um, Joanne Reed and, and different things like this. Reverend Alshaw, they did some good coverage this year on Dr. King and dealt with the revolutionary Dr. King. They did, they did do some good coverage. I have to give them some credit on that. Uh, I think they could have gone a little fur further, but they did do some good coverage. Um, and just to show you something here, I this is one quote that we posted. This was on All In with Chris Hayes. This is from uh, Dr. King, 1967. Now, and, and I posted this on our Facebook fan page, the African History Network, and my YouTube channel, Michael M. Hotep also. And I said, um, I wonder how many Republicans are going to talk about this quote from Dr. King. Now, this is from All In with Chris Hayes. Mehdi Hassan was sitting in for Chris Hayes on Monday, January 17th, 2022. And they did a, a segment about Dr. King, GOP lauds civil rights icon while blocking civil rights. Now, this is Dr. King in 1967. He said, and this, this is in his book, Where Do We Go From Here? Chaos or Community. He said, a society that has done something special against the Negro for hundreds of years must now do something special for the Negro. 
okay and he wasn't talking about a dr king day either so they can't say well we got a dr king day no no they wasn't talking no he's talking about economics okay so don't don't play stupid on us now okay and i and i i posted i said let's see how many republicans use this quote from dr king since they want to talk about content of his character you know not just somebody by uh the color of their skin but the content of their character that's within his speech a council check later called i have a dream but in the speech he's talking about dismantling white supremacy and racism notice how they just skip over that that whole commentary from dr king in the speech that's almost 17 minutes long a society that has done something special against the negro and let me blow this up here a society that has done something special against the negro for hundreds of years must now do something special for the negro so i'm still waiting on some of the republicans to and we could say kirsten cinema and joe Manchin for that matter i'm still waiting on them to quote this from dr king all right but i'm not gonna hold my breath on that i'm not gonna go on a hunger strike either and you know this comes this is something that i talked about at davis elkins college briefly and there's a largely white crowd there very interesting um uh there but i know you have people i respect the people going on hunger strikes you have, you have uh joe madison the black eagle he's on uh 74 i think he's 64 days or 74 days on a hunger strike joe madison but um one of the things i talked about briefly in in, in my my presentation and also i posted on our facebook fan page today uh the african history network i posted there the um article that i wrote back in 2015 and we updated i uh, updated the article today and it's called uh why did dr king tell us to redistribute the pain understanding the power of economic withdrawal and we'll probably talk about this article tomorrow I don't know if we have time to squeeze it in today but um in his last speech april 3rd 1968 Dr. King said we have to kind of find a way to redistribute the pain. He talked about economic withdrawal strategies, and he told the people in Memphis, Tennessee, the sanitation workers, he told them to go out and tell your uh, friends and family to boycott Hearts Bread and Wonder Bread and Seal Test Milk and Coca-Cola because of their because of their discriminatory hiring practices, because of their discriminatory hiring practices. OK, this piece right here. All right. Why did Dr. This is what I posted. Why did Dr. King tell us to redistribute the pain, understanding the power of economic withdrawal? So if you go to we're going to post this on the homepage of our website as well. OK, um, at our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, just click on uh, read articles by Michael M. Hotep and my blog is there. But we're going to post this article right on the homepage so it's easy to find. But this is what we have to understand. See, he, he, talk, he called out corporations and he called for economic boycotts. Of corporations there in memphis tennessee and in this speech dr king said we have to always anchor our external direct action with the power of economic withdrawal we have to always anchor our external direct action with the power of economic withdrawal okay so what this means is when you have mass protests like marches for voting rights and, and the john lewis voting rights act and the freedom to vote act things like this it means that you have to have economic targeted, sustained economic boycotts to target your opponent as well. OK, and I, I deal with this here. So instead of some of us who mean well, instead of some of us who mean well going on hunger strikes and doing our self harm, we should redistribute the pain to some of these corporations and put their cash registers on a hunger strike instead of us going on a hunger strike. Because that don't cost them anything. Instead of us going on a hunger strike, we should redistribute the pain to some of these corporations who came out in, in July of 2021 and signed on to a letter saying that, that saying that they supported passing the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act. But now they have gone silent. And some of these corporations also finance and have donated to Republicans who are blocking the passage of the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act and Joe, Joe Manchin's Freedom to Vote Act. So instead of some of us who mean well and are putting their bodies on the line, but you going on a hunger strike does not redistribute the pain 
to the pressure points where they need to go. We need to put some of these corporations cash registers on a hunger strike. And then you can have a conversation because we're not speaking a language that they understand. And we're not speaking the language that cinema and mansion understand either. You got to redistribute the pain, as Dr. King said. OK, we'll, we'll continue this on the other side of the break. I'm Michael M. Hotel. You listen to the African History Network show. We'll be, we'll be back in a few minutes. iRedify is a black owned digital platform that showcases black and brown cultures and people. The books on the platform are written by African-American authors, Afro-Caribbean authors, African authors and so much more. Kids 14 and under can read ebooks, listen to audiobooks, and complete learning activities. Kids can even write in the books digitally. Get unlimited access to everything on the platform for only $8.99 a month at iRedify.com. Sign up for your membership today. The work that I do is larger than the fashion industry, it's larger than the art world and I believe that I was born to bring newness into this world. I'm Kaima McIntyre, I'm 24 years old and I'm an artist. I create everything from paintings to jewelry design, metaphysical jewelry to be specific, and fashion design. The only reason why my prom dress went viral is because people needed it. Within a few days of going viral, Notori Naughton reached out to me and she's like, I saw your dress, can you make me a dress? I was equally as shocked to be asked by a celebrity to design their dress at the age of 17. That's just one person and the list just continues to go on to Janet Jackson, to Tyra Banks. It really hits home. That means that the discussion is happening on the grounds in real time. We deal with current events of history and politics, education, economic empowerment, entrepreneurship, relationships, love, sex, health issues, and much, much more. Unfortunately, many people confuse what racism is. Racism is a power structure. It was laws and policies that put us in this predicament. It's going to be laws and policies that take us out. So when you control the radius of a man or woman's thoughts, you control the compass of his or her actions because the mind can't do or teach what it doesn't know. We have it all on 910 AM Superstation. <laughs> 910, the Superstation, Detroit's only African American talk radio. Welcome back to the African History Network show, right here on 910 AM, the Superstation, the Future Radio. I'm your host, Brother Michael M. Hotep. It is Tuesday, January 18th, 2022. And we are live. Call in numbers 313 778 7600. 313 778 7600 is the call in number. Uh, if you have a question or comment. OK, so uh, right before the break, we were talking about this uh, article from Huffington Post. And Nicole Hannah Jones had to give some people the Dr. King treatment or some people would say she gave them the Della Reese treatment. Uh, sometimes you just got to <laughs> go off on them like Della Reese did in Harlem Nights when they came out the jail. <laughs> right. <laughs> And she told and she's she told the police kiss her and tie behind. Sometimes you just gotta do that, okay? But anyway. <laughs> but Nicole Hannah Jones does it in a very dignified, intellectual way. And the people may not even realize she cussed them out till they get home and realize what she said. You know, she's she's very she's a very sophisticated intelligence system. Nicole Hannah Jones gives 1619 Project critics the MLK tribute. Uh, they, des they deserve. So if we go back to this piece here um, and she laid out in some tweets what she said in her speech and, and she quoted, she spent the majority of her speech actually quoting passages from Dr. King, but the people uh, who objected to her being there didn't even know she was quoting Dr. King because they haven't studied Dr. King. So we, we go, it, go, it goes on, this, this article goes on to say, um, White America, she said uh, in her speech, white Americans must recognize that justice for black people cannot be achieved without radical changes in the structure of our society, without radical changes in the structure of our society. The evils of capitalism are real as the evils of militarism. The evils of capitalism are real as the evils of militarism. 
The problems of racial injustice and economic injustice cannot be solved without a radical redistribution of political and economic power. Because th this is what Dr. King was for. He, he was for radical. Dr. King was a socialist, by the way. OK. And he was for a radical redistribution of resources and economic power and political power. A nation that continues year after year to spend more dollars on military defense than on programs of social uplift is approaching spiritual death is approaching spiritual death. The crowning achievement in hypocrisy must go to those staunch Republicans and Democrats of the Midwest and West who were given land by our gov government when they came here as immigrants from Europe. They were given education through the land grant colleges. Now, he said this in 1968. OK, he said this in 1968. And they talk about this in, in the book. Um, uh, uh, what's it, uh, How white folks got so rich, the untold story of American white supremacy. And I don't know where my copy is because I have three copies of it. I have the first, second, third edition. I don't know what the hell my book is. I got to find that. Okay. Did it fall down? I don't know where my copy is. All right, but anyway, those are the same people that now say to black people whose ass were brought, brought to this country in chains and who are emancipated, who were emancipated in 1863 without being given land to cultivate or bread to eat that they must pull themselves up by their own bootstraps. What they truly advocate is socialism for the rich and capitalism for the poor. These are all passages from Dr. King's speeches. What they truly advocate is socialism for the rich and capitalism for the poor. We know full well that racism is still that hound of hell which dogs, which dogs the tracks of our civilization. We know full well that racism is still that hound of hell, which dogs the tracks of our civilization. Ever since the birth of our nation, white America has had a schizophrenic personality of the race. She has been torn between cells, a self in which she proudly professes the great principle of democracy and a self in which she madly practices the antithesis of democracy. This is Dr. King. This is the revolutionary Dr. King. They usually don't show you on the television. They usually don't talk about it. Corporate sponsored lunches and breakfasts. They just want to go to those. One, I don't get invited Two, I mean, I could go, but you know, I definitely don't get invited to speak. I remember I spoke back in 2015 at the Charles H. Wright Museum of African American History for their Dr. King Day celebration, and I did my I did my presentation, and 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 I and I deal with I dealt with uh, 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 Dr. King trying to get a concealed pistol license in 1956 in Montgomery, Alabama during the Montgomery bus boycott because Dr. King's house was firebombed twice in Montgomery, Alabama. I talked about the book uh, "This Nonviolent Stuff to Get You Killed" by Professor Charles E. Cobb Jr., who was a a field secretary for 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 SNCC for five years in rural Mississippi. This book right here that everybody should read that the that the first installment of Eyes on the Prize doesn't deal with this type of stuff. Um, the second installment of Eyes on the Prize deals with the uh, Deacons for Defense and Justice. But the the first installment of Eyes on the Prize doesn't deal with um, the armed resistance that took place. Now, this is the preeminent book on the Deacons for Defense and Justice by Lance Hill, the Deacons for Defense. I talked about this book and I had it up on the on the big screen as I was doing a PowerPoint presentation. And I told him, I said, you trying to tell me that the Deacons for Defense and Justice are not part of the civil rights movement because they were armed and they were protecting civil rights workers. And sometimes Dr. King used them for his own personal protection or for the protection of civil rights workers. I said, you trying to tell me that they're not part of the civil rights movement because as one of my teachers, Professor Jane Small, told me personally, because he was there, he said the civil rights movement was not a nonviolent movement. Because you read this book right here, this nonviolent stuff that gets you killed, how guns made the civil rights movement possible. This book deals with the armed resistance during the civil rights movement 
and how it was Negroes with guns protecting the nonviolent civil rights workers. So they would be over in the cars with the guns telling them, okay, you go do your nonviolent direct action. You go ahead and march. We'll be over here with the guns to protect you because they couldn't get protection from the police. Professor Charles E. Cobb Jr. was there. He was a, he was a field secretary for SNCC, Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, for five years in rural Mississippi. If you know anything about Mississippi in the 60s, you know that was very, very dangerous work. Trying to register black people to vote, you know that was very dangerous work. Okay, and he said that anytime they stayed at somebody's homes, all because you grew up in the gun culture in the South. So all those people own guns. All Most of those African-Americans own guns. Dr. King owned guns until Bayard Rustin convinced him to get rid of his guns. Reverend Fred Shuttlesworth in Birmingham, Alabama owned guns. Raymond Parks, Rosa Parks' husband owned guns. Fannie Lou Hamer owned guns. Fannie Lou Hamer said she kept a shotgun in every corner of her bedroom. And the first white man that looked like he was going to throw some dynamite on her porch wouldn't live to write his mother. This is Fannie Lou Hamer. They quote Fannie Lou Hamer saying, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. They don't talk about the armed resistance during the civil rights movement. So. The second installment of Eyes on the Prize, in that second installment, they deal with the Deacons for Defense and Justice. They interview Huey P. Newton and Bobby Seale and talk about the Black Panther Party for self-defense, things like this. But the first install, installment of Eyes on the Prize, even though it's good, is more sanitized. But you read this book right here, you get a fuller understanding of the civil rights movement. If it had, had not been for Negroes with guns, and going back before the Deacons for Defense of Justice, you had Robert F. Williams in the Black Guard. And Robert F. Williams was the president of the remote uh, Monroe County NAACP in North Carolina, if I remember correctly. And he organized African Americans into what was known as the Black Guard, and they were armed, protecting civil rights workers, protecting African Americans from the Ku Klux Klan, things like this. You, you, you study that history, you get a much better, better understanding of the civil rights movement that they don't show you on the television. But anyway, let's get back to this because we run out of time. So the, um, Nicole Hannah-Jones, quoting Dr. King, the people who never read Dr. King, said, the fact is there has never been a single solid determined commitment on the part of the vast majority of white Americans to genuine equality for black people. She said, the step backwards has a new name today. It is called the white backlash. It is called the white, this is what Dr. King said. The step backwards has a new name today. It is called the white backlash, but the white backlash is nothing new. It is the surfacing of old prejudices, hostilities and ambivalences that, ha that have always been there. The white backlash of today is rooted in the same problem that has characterized America since the black man landed in chains on the shores of this nation. Now, we know because we talked about Dr. David M. Hotel. We've had him on the show here 13 times or 14 times. And this is a book here. The first Americans were Africans documented evidence. We know when African people first came here, we, we were here before Native Americans came into this. We understand this, but this is what Dr. King is saying. So, OK. This, this is good enough for this is good enough for right now. Whites, it must be frank, it must frankly be said, are not putting in a similar mass effort to re-educate themselves out of their racial ignorance. With each modest advance, the white population promptly raises the argument that black Americans have come far enough. With each modest advance, the white population promptly raises the argument that black Americans have come, see, have come far enough. And see, when you read a letter from a Birmingham jail, he in 1963, he addresses this. And the white moderates and people telling them, you know, you, you're moving too quickly. For the good of America, she goes on to quote Dr. King, for the good of America, it is necessary to refute the idea that the dominant ideology in our country even today is freedom and equality and that racism is just an occasional departure from the norm on the part of a few bigoted extremists. We'll continue this on the other side of the break. Listen to the African History Network show. I'm Michael M. Hotel. We'll be back in a few minutes. iRedify is a black owned digital platform that showcases black and brown cultures and people. The books on the platform are written by African-American authors, 
Afro-Caribbean authors, African authors, and so much more. Kids 14 and under can read ebooks, listen to audiobooks, and complete learning activities. Kids can even write in the books digitally. Get unlimited access to everything on the platform for only $8.99 a month at iredify.com. Sign up for your membership today. Mental health and well-being have long been a taboo subject in the so-called African-American community. So I enlisted the help of mental health experts, thought leaders, and activists to help kill the ghost of Willie Lynch and heal from post-traumatic slave syndrome. We experience trauma a lot of times um, on a subconscious level. So sometimes something happens to us and we know that it's traumatizing, but we don't really recognize the extent of the trauma. Black on Purpose Television Network. Yes, Black on Purpose Television Network. All black, all positive, all the time. The largest black owned streaming television network in the world. Bringing our people together worldwide. Controlling our messages, our story, our way. Black TV, the way it should be. Black music, black history, and more. 30 plus channels, thousands of shows. Black on Purpose Television Network. Subscribe now. Start watching the content and you still have full access to the class even after the class is over with. Okay, right before the break, um, we were talking about the um, this article here from Huffington Post. A lot of these other topics we'll, we'll get to tomorrow night. Uh, Nicole Hannah-Jones gives 1619 Project critics the MLK tribute they deserve. The 1619 Project author reads excerpts from Dr. King's speeches without telling anyone that she was doing so. They thought it, these were her words because they haven't studied Dr. King without telling anyone that she was doing so, leading the audience to think Dr. King's words were hers, but she was giving them a history lesson. Before we go back to this, let's go to the phone lines. Let's talk to Jerome. Jerome, welcome to the African History Network show. Thanks for holding. Tell us where you're calling from. Do we have Jerome on the line? Hello? I'm calling from Detroit, Michigan. Detroit. Hey. Okay, Jerome, go ahead. Thanks for hey. holding. Go ahead. Uh, thank you for letting me briefly join the discussion. Uh, you know, you, you are the reason that we tell people to know their story because uh, they're using critical race theory specifically to guard against what you're teaching. Mm -hmm. um, and, and when you say in corporations, I, I, I wish you would mention the list of, of corporations that went back on their word when they said that they were go weren't going to donate money to uh, the, the uh, senators who didn't who who, who, certif who didn't want the election certified. Right, uh, right. Now, I've talked about that here on this went, show. They went back on their word. And yeah, I've talked about that here on this show. Let, let, uh, let's look at this article right quick from the New York Times because we run out of time, Jerome. I'm glad you brought that up. The name of this article, Corporations Donated Millions to Lawmakers who voted to overturn election results. Okay. This is from, this is from the New York times, January 6, 2022. And then it's a big article that deals with, with deals just with what you're talking about, but go ahead. Mainly, no student needs to be able to graduate from any public school or institution without knowing our story in its entirety. Mm -hmm. It's real simple. If, if they knew better, they would do better. If we knew better, we would be better. Right, right. And keep bringing it. Okay. All right. Thanks, man. Call back tomorrow night. Okay. I appreciate it. Uh, many. Uh, so we look very quickly here because we run out of time. Look at everybody read this article here from the New York Times. We talked about here a number of times here on the show. Corporations donated millions to lawmakers who voted to overturn election results. In voting to overturn election results, because they, they they donated to 143 of the 147 Republicans who voted to overturn election results. And um, these were, and they're overturning the election results of African-Americans. They're overturning, nullifying the votes of African-Americans when they do this. Latinos, Asian-Americans, things like this, but especially African-Americans, okay? Many of the corporations that have donated are household names, including Boeing, Pfizer, General Motors, Ford Motor Company, AT&T, and UPS. 
read this article here for, for more information and they get, deal with more companies and their responses because I, I don't i can't get deep into it here but we've talked about this before here on the show okay um go back to the nicole hannah jones piece the white backlash of today is rooted in the same problem that has characterized America ever since the black man landed in chains on the shores of this nation. This is she's quoting Dr. King, but people didn't know she was quoting Dr. King. She's quoting speeches from Dr. King. See, a lot of people just like to hear passages from Dr. King that make white people feel comfortable with the oppression of African-Americans. Dr. King was a revolutionary. OK, whites, it must frankly be said are not putting in a similar mass effort to re-educate themselves out of their racial ignorance. With each modest advance, the white population promptly raises the argument that black Americans have come far enough, okay? For the good of America, Dr. King said, for the good of America, it is necessary to refute the idea that the dominant ideology in our country, even today is freedom and equality, and that racism is just an occasional departure from the norm on the part of a few bigoted extremists. Racism, now this is me, this is not Dr. King. Racism is a system of advantage and privilege distributed based upon race coming out of the ideology of European white supremacy. Racism occurs when one race of people control the majority of the wealth, power, resources, privileges, benefits, land, access to education, access to opportunity, health care, education, jobs media etc and they use that to marginalize subordinate and do harm to another race of people okay this is what racism is now if america does not respond creatively to the challenge to banish racism some future historian will have to say that a great civilization died because it lacked the soul and commitment to make justice a reality for all men why do white people seem to find that this is dr king once again because people just want to quote passages from dr king that make them feel warm and fuzzy why do white people seem to find it so difficult to understand that black people are sick and tired of having reluctantly parceled out to them those rights and privileges which all others receive upon birth or entry into america I never cease to wonder at the amazing presumption of much of white society, assuming that they have the right to bargain with the with with the black for their freedom. I never cease to wonder at the amazing presumption of much of white society, assuming that they have the right to bargain with the black for their freedom. Now, Nicole Hannah Jones said the audience did not seem comfortable hearing a ringing endorsement toward ending systemic racism and promoting democratic socialism and had no idea she was quoting Dr. King because they never read Dr. King in the first place. Okay, uh, those watching on Facebook and YouTube, keep watching for a few more minutes. We're gonna keep going on for a few more minutes and then we'll deal with the rest of this tomorrow night. Uh, visit our website, africanhistorynetwork.com. If you like this type of information, also you can support the African History Network because we definitely need your support. Dollar sign, the AHN show through Cash App and um, uh, also through PayPal, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show. Right now, it's correct your own behavior. It's not over till we win Wakanda forever. And we'll talk to you tomorrow. Peace. All right. Um, I want to, let's see here. Well, I, I'm going to play, I'll play a short excerpt of the presentation that I did um, at the college. We'll, we'll play a few minutes of that and we'll deal with some more of that tomorrow. I want to get to some of these other topics here. Um, there was a and we'll deal with some of these other topics here more in depth on uh tomorrow's show so there was a um article dealing with mitch mcconnell and mitch mcconnell um posted about dr king and he treated he got um uh, a lot of backlash for this. If we look at this piece from The Independent. McConnell bombarded. McConnell bombarded with criticism. Over voting rights stance after posting Martin Luther King Day tribute. This is Moscow Mitch. OK, who 
voted to reauthorize the Voting Rights Act in 2006, but was on the Senate floor today speaking out against uh, the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act and the in the in the uh, uh, Freedom to Vote Act. He's against uh, passing these Voting Rights Acts now, but he voted to reauthorize them in 2006. And he had the nerve to post about uh, Dr. King. Okay, so let's go to this here. And I want to, okay, let's see here. Let's change the title here. And also Kirsten Cinema, Kirsten Cinema, and I started spelling her name with three Ks. Uh, she had a nerd to post about Dr. King as well. Okay, so this is from uh, the independent uh, .co.uk. McConnell bombarded with criticism over voting rights stance after posting Martin Luther King Day tribute. Martin Luther King Jr. would be rolling over in his grave at McConnell's hypocrisy. Now, uh, Mitch McConnell has been branded a hypocrite for posting a tribute to Martin Luther King Jr. while leading Republican efforts while leading Republican efforts to obstruct new voting rights legislation. Mitch McConnell was among several Republicans who took to social media like uh, like Lindsey Graham. I mean, not Lindsey Graham, Marco Rubio, Marco Rubio. And then you also had um, uh, McCarthy. We'll talk about little Kevin in just a minute. Mitch McConnell was among several Republicans who took to social media to praise Dr. King. Uh, on Dr. King Day, Mitch McConnell tweeted, he posted on social media, nearly 60 years ago, nearly 60 years since the March on Washington, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s message echoes as powerfully as it did that day. The Senate Minority uh, Leader wrote on social media, his legacy inspires us to celebrate and keep building upon the remarkable progress of a great nation, uh, our great nation has made toward becoming a more perfect union. What the hell world are you living in? What, what was Dr. King's message? Because the speech, he's talking about dismantling white supremacy and racism and holding America accountable for a promissory note that African-Americans were given 100 years prior with the Emancipation Proclamation and holding America accountable to the Declaration of Independence and the U.S. Constitution. So what what message echoes as powerfully as it did that day? What, what, what message are you talking about? Now, Dr. King's eldest son, Martin Luther King III, who is leading a protest march in Washington, who is leading a protest march in Washington on Monday, January 17th, Dr. King Day, said he would, quote, not accept empty promises in pursuit of my father's dream, not accept empty promises in pursuit of my father's dream. Martin Luther King III tweeted, um, this MLK day, I will not accept empty promises in pursuit of my father's dream. I do not want to see photo ops of elected officials if they are not willing to put voting rights over the filibuster. I do not want to see photo ops from elected officials if they are not willing to put voting rights over the filibuster. Today is a day of service and action. Congress must, quote, deliver for voting rights. Congress must, quote, deliver for voting, hashtag deliver for voting rights. Now, his uh, uh, Martin Luther King III earlier criticized elected from both parties for, uh, for tweeting about his father, quote, while standing in the way of voting rights. Okay? And it's not just about the right to vote is about whose vote gets counted. It's about voter su subversion. And it's about uh, these voter suppression laws that are giving power to state election boards to overturn election results at the county level that they don't like, like in Georgia, SB202. So, it's, 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 so this is beyond just somebody being able to vote is also dealing with removing obstructions to the polls. It's, it, it's, uh, it's, it's restoring the 
uh, pre-clearance, restoring the oversight from the Department of Justice and the, and 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 uh, and the federal courts when it comes to changing the locations of uh, polling places, when it comes to determining how many uh, Sundays of polls to the souls voting you have or voting on Sunday you have, how many days of uh, of early voting you have. It's a number of different things that uh, was was um, struck down when Shelby County versus Holder Week in Section 4 of the Voting Rights Act that dealt with the pre-clearance. And that was targeting these former Confederate states that had a history of putting obstacles in the way of the 15th Amendment. So Martin Luther King III said he, he criticized officials from both parties for tweeting about his father, quote, while standing in the way of voting rights, end quote, and called on filibuster reform to allow new voting laws to be passed. Now, attempts to pass the John Lewis Voting Rights Act, which would restore protections against voter discrimination, have stalled in the Senate where Republicans such as Ted Cruz vowed to block its passage. A little slimy ass flying line, Ted Cruz. Twitter users said Dr. King would be rolling over in his grave at Mitch McConnell's hypocrisy. Okay, um, now someone else on Twitter said, keep MLK's name out your mouth since you and your party have done more to obstruct his dream from coming to pass than any other source. Okay, so read the rest of this also. Uh, somebody else said, you spent your entire life undoing his work. So read this piece here from independent.co.uk. McConnell bombarded with criticism over voting rights stance after posting Martin Luther King Day tribute. What the hell kind of tribute is that? Okay, now then you had um, this piece here from, there was one from, uh, which one was this? There was one about, Kirsten Cinema, because I didn't think she was going to be dumb enough to actually uh, post on social media about Dr. King after she's refusing to budge on filibuster reform. But she's dumb enough. She's dumber than I thought. And she makes she makes dumb blondes look like road scholars. She's so stupid. Uh, this piece here. Okay, which one is this? Okay, there's one from Newsweek. Uh, McCarthy cinema trolled as tone deaf on voting rights after MLK remembrance tweets. This one here from uh, newsweek.com. Let me pull this one up. Okay, McCarthy Cinema, uh, Kevin McCarthy, House Minority Leader, Kevin McCarthy of California, little slimy, uh, spineless Kevin McCarthy. McCarthy Cinema trolled as tone deaf over voting rights and MLK remembrance tweets. So social media uh, users called out tone deaf uh, politicians for paying tribute to Dr. King on social media while blocking a bill that would expand voting rights. Many, many legislators shared posts honoring Dr. King on Monday and the celebration of his birthday, but some faced scrutiny for their refusal to pass the legislation, which has received support from Dr. King's family and civil rights activists and voting rights activists and things like this. The bill would expand voting access across the United States and restore, restore key provisions to the Voting Rights Act of 1965. The, and you needed the Voting Rights Act of 1965 because of what happened in, at the Mississippi State Convention in 1890. And it took, it took 75 years from 1890 to 1965, okay? When you had the Mississippi State uh, Convention 
where they passed when they where they rewrote the state constitution and they and they wrote into the state constitution poll taxes and literacy tests to suppress the African American vote. The white county judge that presided over the uh, convention, his name was Solomon Saladin Calhoun. He said, we came here to exclude the Negro. African-Americans were the majority of the population in Mississippi and the majority of the voters in Mississippi. This became known as the Mississippi plan. Then it became the model throughout the South that was adopted by other Southern states rewriting their state constitutions to suppress the African-American vote and lock us out of political power. It allowed us to get voted out of office because we were in um, in state legislatures and things like this uh, during Reconstruction. And even after Reconstruction, there's still going to be some of us in state legislatures and political uh, offices. OK, so this is why you needed a Voting Rights Act of 1965. And if you read this uh, article here, if you read this article here, um, how Jim Crow era laws, and I deal with this in, in the online class that I teach, from the Civil War to the Civil Rights Movement of Black Power, 1865 to 1968. We get deep in this because we look at some of the state constitutions. We go through and look to understand how history, law, politics connect. So we go look at some of the state constitutions. We look at some of the Reconstruction era constitutions like the Alabama uh, state constitution in 1867, the Reconstruction constitution. Then we look at the Alabama state constitution rewritten in 1901 to codify white supremacy after, after Reconstruction ended in 1877. So let me uh, pull this up here, okay. Now, this article right here deals with uh, some of this history, how Jim Crow era law suppressed the African-American vote for generations. In the wake of the passage of the 15th Amendment of 1870 and Reconstruction, which in eight, Reconstruction is 1865 to 1877, several Southern states enacted laws that restricted Black Americans access to voting. So if you don't understand this background history, you won't understand what's taking place now and the uh, voter restriction bills that, that are being pushed by Republicans in uh, state legislatures. There's over 400 voter restriction bills. States have passed 34 uh, voter restriction bills and there's more coming. Now, also at the same time, and that's the Brennan Center for Justice reporting on that, the same time, Democrats in 25 states have passed laws making it easier to vote. But you have... Republicans that control about 31, 30 or 31 of the state legislatures. OK, so in 25 states, 62 uh, in 25 states, 62 uh, uh, in. Um, let me see. Hold on. You have. Um, Republicans control about 30 of the state legislatures. OK, but in 25 states. Democrats have been pushing and they've gotten uh, 62 new bills passed to make it easier to vote. But the critical bills to watch are the ones that are being passed to suppress the vote, especially in these 19 states like Georgia, Texas, uh, Alabama, Mississippi, things like this. At the 18. Uh, OK, so they talk about the 1890 Mississippi State Convention. Then they go through and they deal with uh, literacy tests, uh, anti-literacy laws in many Southern states made it illegal to teach enslaved people to read. In 1880, according to the U.S. Bureau of Census, 76% of Southern African Americans were illiterate. In 1880, according to the U.S. Bureau of Census, the Census Bureau, 76% of Southern African-Americans were illiterate, a rate of 55% points or percentage points greater than that for Southern white people. So literacy tests became a way to get around the 15th Amendment that guaranteed the right to vote for African-American men. Literacy tests and poll taxes became ways to get around this. And then in the U.S. Supreme Court case 
of Williams versus Mississippi, 1898, that challenged the poll taxes and literacy test, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled that the poll taxes and literacy test did not violate the 15th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution. So they so the U.S. Supreme Court said it was legal to do this. Now, in 1900, 50 percent of voting age African-American men could not read in 1900 compared to 12 percent of voting age white men. These disparities made literacy tests one of the most effective tools at suppressing the African-American vote. The voting clerks who were always white and the, the registrars, the voting clerks, things like this, could all could all could also pass or fail a person at their discretion based on race. A lot of a lot of the voting clerks were functionally illiterate as well. A lot of them couldn't pass these tests. Illiterate white people were often excluded from these literacy tests through the use of grandfather clauses. Now, the grandfather clause was first introduced in 1898 by Louisiana, and that's written into the Louisiana state constitution. The grandfather clause stated that if your grandfather prior to 1867 could vote, then you could vote. Okay, now 1867 is two years after the Civil War ends. Okay, so if your grandfather was African American, good chance he was a slave at that time, or, you know, prior to 1867. Good chance he was enslaved. So, and good chance he couldn't vote. So, if it, so if your grandfather could not vote prior to 1867, okay, then that means you can't vote. This was the grandfather clause that was used by Louisiana and then adopted by other Southern states as well as a way to get around the 15th Amendment. So illiterate white people were often excluded from these literacy tests through the use of through the use of grandfather clauses, which which tied their voting rights to their grandfathers before the Civil War. Former slaves who had no voting rights until the 15th Amendment could obviously not benefit from this provision. The grandfather clause also applied to poll taxes, which was a which was a tax that you had to pay to register to vote. The grandfather clause also applied to poll taxes, which were another measure created by white dominated Southern legislatures to suppress the black vote. So they're rewriting these state constitutions in the South to impose these voter suppression measures. This is why you needed a Voting Rights Act in 1965 to make all of that stuff illegal. So then they talk about poll taxes. Um, then they go through and talk about all white primaries, like in Texas. And that was, and, and that led to the U.S. Supreme Court case, 1944, uh, Smith versus Allwright. And, uh, and, and that lawsuit was filed by uh, Thurgood Marshall. When literacy tests, poll taxes, grandfather clauses, and many other ways to circumvent the 15th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution did not work to suppress black voter turnout like, like they wanted it to. It, it suppressed black voter turnout, but still it, it, not as much as they wanted it to in, in, in many cases. White legislators in several southern states used all white primaries. White legislators in several southern states used all white primaries to all but eliminate black voters presence in the electoral process. In Texas, for example, and we see Texas pass their critical race theory law because they want to suppress the teaching of this type of history. In Texas, for example, the legislature gave the Democratic Party the authority to set its own rules, the state legislature in Texas. The party determined that it was for white voters only. The party determined it was for white voters only, excluding African-Americans from its elections and effectively making local electoral politics dominated by one party that upheld Jim Crow laws. After a white election official blocked an African-American man named Lonnie E. Smith 
the right to vote in the 1940 Texas Democratic primary, the NAACP's Thurgood Marshall and William H. Hasty challenged the case all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court. In 1944, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled in Smith versus Allwright that the Texas white primary system was unconstitutional. Quote, the right to vote in a primary for the nomination of candidates without discrimination by the state is a right secured by the U.S. Constitution, the U.S. Supreme Court said in its 8-1 decision in Smith, Smith versus All Right, 1944. Then it goes and talks about the Voting Rights Act and why you needed the Voting Rights Act in 1965. Okay, then it deals with Shelby County, Shelby County versus Holder, 2013 U.S. Supreme Court case that we talked about uh, last Friday when I was on Roland Martin Unfiltered and on our Sunday show, uh, our Sunday, uh, January 16th show, I played a segment from Roland Martin Unfiltered because uh, Roland uh, interviewed uh, Representative James Clyburn as well as Reverend William Barber on, on that show. And I, I shared an excerpt um, from our Sunday show. So go back and watch the Sunday show, January 16th. But in Shelby County versus Holder, the U.S. Supreme Court. Now, Shelby County is in Alabama. The holder they were suing was Attorney General Eric Holder at the time. Alabama was ground zero for the fight for the 1965 Voting Rights Act, the Selma to Montgomery March. Montgomery is the capital of Alabama. OK, so all this deals with Alabama. And you, you go back and read the uh, Alabama state constitution of 1901. That they said was written to codify white supremacy. In 2013, the U.S. Supreme Court walked back. Part of the Voting Rights Act when it ruled in a 5-4 vote that constraints placed on certain states and federal review of states voting procedures were outdated. In the wake of the Shelby County Holder decision, several states have enacted laws limiting voter access, including ID requirements, limits on early voting, mail-in voting, and more. But also what they did was restricted the number of polling places. Also, what they did was restricted the number of polling places. So in the 2016 presidential election, which was Donald Trump versus Hillary Clinton, there were 868 fewer polling places. Because one of the things they did within 24 hours, the Shelby County versus Holder U.S. Supreme Court decision taking place. Which is why presidential elections are so important, because presidents nominate Supreme Court justices and why U.S. Uh, Senate races are so important because it's the U.S. Senate that confirms Supreme Court justices as well as federal judges. But in uh, after Shelby County versus Holder, within 24 hours, start state start uh, state started passing new voter ID laws to suppress the vote. Then they started shutting down polling places and polling places. And uh, uh, the majority of the polling places they shut down were in areas that had higher uh, African-American populations and Hispanic populations. So if we look at the piece from uh, the nation.com that Ari, uh, Ari Berman wrote November 4th, 2016, which was four days before the November 8th, 2016 presidential election. And I talked about all this at the time on my radio show because I was covering the um presidential election hard because I saw what was coming. I was warning people about Donald Trump. People thought this was about one person versus another. I said, no, this is about the trajectory of this country. And, and I talked about what was at stake. Stake I dealt with the Supreme Court, federal courts, all different types of things like this. I warned people about Trump. People didn't listen. A lot of people didn't listen. There are 868 fewer places to vote in 2016 because the Supreme Court gutted the Voting Rights Act of 1965. Nearly half of the counties that previously approved voting changes with the federal government have cut polling places this election. So this contributes to longer lines. This contributes to people being discouraged and, and getting out of line and going home and not wanting to go vote. Okay, so read this, read this piece here from 2016 by Ari Berman for The Nation. And this deals with 868 fewer polling places. 
So then you go and look at uh, the article from Mother Jones. Um, then you go look at the article from Mother Jones. And you look at this one right here. More than 1,600 polling places have closed since the Supreme Court gutted the Voting Rights Act. More than 1,600 polling places have closed uh, six to, since the Supreme Court uh, gutted the Voting Rights Act. Now, this article is from uh, September 10th, 2019. Most of them in minority communities. Most of them in minority communities. This is by Matt Cohen for uh, Mother Jones. And then go read this article. This deal, and this is tied to Shelby County versus Holder once again, U.S. Supreme Court decision. For uh, in 2013, the Supreme Court gutted the core provision that at the core provision of the Voting Rights Act, the requirement for certain states with a history of voter discrimination to pre-clear changes in their election rules with the federal government. For decades, the 1965, the 1965 law helped secure the right to vote for hundreds of thousands of people in nine states as what well, so these were nine states that, that, that had a history of putting obstacles in the way of the 15th amendment so former confederate states former southern the, those southern a lot of southern states as well as certain certain jurisdictions in six other states which had a history of discrimination against minority voters but in the 5-4 decision in shelby county versus holder the court ruled that the coverage formula for determining those jurisdictions subject to preclearance was outdated and therefore unconstitutional. The consequence of the Shelby County decision, the consequences of the Shelby County decision were immediate. States that had previously fallen under the jurisdiction of the Voting Rights Act of 1965 immediately passed tough voter restriction laws and restructured election systems. They started passing laws within 24 hours of that decision being made from the US Supreme Court. So read the rest of this uh, article also. Report more than 1600 polling places have closed since the Supreme Court gutted the Voting Rights Act. Most of them are in minority, are in minority communities. All right. Let's see here. Uh, okay, stand by. Let me refresh the screen here. Okay, we're back. Okay, I had to log back in for some reason. Okay. All right. Now, um, let's see here. I want to go to this uh, interview that Representative James Clyburn did. Uh, he did this interview with Craig Melvin on MSNBC on uh, Monday, January 17th, 2022, Dr. King Day. How's everybody doing? Share this broadcasting on social media platforms. Invite your friends to tune in. Give us a thumbs up if you like this uh, type of information. If you like this show, stand by. All right, stand by. Let me cue this up. Okay, so this is from uh, Monday, January 17th. 
I want to bring in House Majority Whip, Congressman Jim Clyburn of South Carolina, uh, someone else who's been uh, fighting the fight, if you will, uh, long before he had had a few gray hairs. Congressman, uh, always good to have you, my friend. Thanks for your time. When it, when, it, when it comes to Democrats who support the Freedom to Vote Act and the John Lewis Voting Rights Act, Congressman Clyburn, but, but don't support changing Senate rules just to get them passed. You said something uh, that caught my attention over the week, and you said, quote, I don't think you're on the wrong side of history. Is there any reason to believe at this point anyone uh, can sway the, the one or two senators who have made up their minds that they're not going to change the Senate rules? Well, thank you very much for having me, Greg. I, I don't know if we've changed their minds at all. I don't know uh, that we ever changed the mind uh, of the segregationists in the South uh, who held fast uh, to their beliefs uh, that blacks did not have an unfettered vote. But I do know this. They were on the wrong side of history. And just because you are on the prevailing side doesn't mean you're on the right side. And so uh, I will say to all, of my friends that they're in the Senate, uh, that nobody is asking you to give up the filibuster. And I wish they would stop saying that. We asking you to do for voting rights and constitutional rights the same thing that you've done for the budget. You raised the debt you limit. Uh, so we're asking you to do for voting rights and constitutional rights the same thing that you've done for the budget. And you do not allow one person or any group of people uh, to filibuster the vote, the budget, when you are trying to preserve the full faith and credit of the United States of America. That's how we raised the debt limit uh, several weeks ago. And that's how we got the budget several months ago, simply because we do not allow the filibuster to hold up the budget. So why should the filibuster hold up people's constitutional rights like voting? So we have asked respectfully, that you allow the same kind of reconciliation on constitutional rights that you allow uh, on budgetary issues. That's all. If you want to have the filibuster in order to bring policy issues forward and have a debate on those policy issues, then that's fine. But not my constitutional rights. But then there's another thing. I ask people to look at the history of the 15th Amendment and see how that was passed. They were passed on a party line vote. And for Mr. Manchin to tell me that the vote is not creditable uh, unless you have bipartisan to vote, he is telling me that it was not credible, uh, creditable for uh, my uh, pro uh, to get the right to vote when the 15th Amendment passed, because that was a party line vote. So they are all on the wrong side of history and they are misquoting and misusing the history of this country. Congressman, what, what do you think's behind it? I, I mean, to, be, to, to your point, I mean, the, the filibuster, there have been carve-outs. There are routinely carve-outs. So what is it about this particular issue that, that you think, um, and we'll, we can use their names, Senator Manchin, Senator Sinema, what do you think it is that's holding them back from, from, from changing the rules to vote for these two bills specifically? Senator Manchin seemed to feel that he uh, has as a part of his forte of preserving the minority voting rights to the Senate. He seemed to say that at the time he talked. My Republican colleague, I've got to, uh, I don't want to disrespect my Republican colleague, but if disrespecting his Republican colleagues or, or respecting them, will run the risk of disrespecting the minority in his caucus. This disrespects Warnock. Warnock is from Georgia. Georgia is the is ground zero when it comes to these kinds of laws. It is Georgia that just passed a law that allows for nullification of the vote. And I'm going to say to people on my side, stop talking about all we need to do is organize them and rally, uh, get our people to the polls. That's not the problem. No matter how many people you get to the poll, if you set up a process by which you can nullify the result, and that's what they've done in Georgia, that's what we're trying to get rid of. That's the John R. Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act. It's all about 
having pre-clearance measures in place that says if you pass a law, it must go to a court or to the Justice Department and all of a sudden to determine whether or not this law will have any kind of discriminatory impact and if so, you cannot implement it. That's what we had in the Civil Rights Act of 1965 until the Supreme Court got rid of it. So I want to say to my Republican friends, like uh, Senator uh, uh, Romney over the weekend, saying the 65 Voting Rights Act is still the law and it still prevents the. That's not true. The Civil Rights Act is still in place, but the pre clearance section, the formula in Section 4, has been gotten rid of by the Supreme Court. We have not had that for nine years. And Senator Romney ought to be ashamed of himself for saying that. Um, it sounds like you've you've run out of patience, uh, Congressman Clyburn. Yes, I, I have. Absolutely. I, yes, I, I, have. I wonder. I, I wonder if, from a, a, a strategic standpoint, a legislative strategy, do you think we would be here if the administration had perhaps started with voting rights in, instead of starting with uh, infrastructure or Build Back Better? Do you think, from a strategic standpoint? This is something that they should have started with earlier in the administration. No, I don't think so at all. I think that what you've had, you've had this argument earlier. You've had the result uh, that we expect tomorrow and the next day earlier. And you would not have had uh, this bipartisan infrastructure bill. And you would not have had uh, the so-called Rescue Act. Mm -hmm. Now, we passed the Rescue Act. It did great things. And it's still doing great things. That has expired a, a, a significant portion of it. And that's why we need Build Back Better. And the same people who are stopping this, they're stopping Build Back Better. And the child uh, tax credit that we need in place now is in Build Back Better. Affordable housing that we need for people who lost their houses and lost their wealth is now got less than half of the wealth that white people have, we need the affordable housing bill. That's in Build Back Better. Mm -hmm. And so the people who are stopping Build Back Better, stopping voting, they are trying to go to the heart of what's needed in the African-American community in order for us to maintain this pursuit of perspective that we have been on for a long, long time. These people are supporting autocracy over democracy, and that's the big issue here. We would have come earlier if the president had put this out there earlier. Last question uh, before I let you go on this MLK day. Uh, you knew Dr. King. You marched with Dr. King. Um, what What do you think the, the late Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. would, would say about where we are uh, right now in our country at this time? He'll remind us of what he wrote from the Birmingham City Jail when he sat there and he got that letter from eight white clergymen, one of whom had a South Carolina connection, uh, telling him that he was a disruptive force in Birmingham, that he should go back to Atlanta. Dr. King sat down and he wrote to them, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. And I want everybody in America to understand that today. Injustice in the South, injustice in Georgia, Texas, Florida, there's injustice everywhere. Those states that have passed, 19 states that have passed these laws, 34 different laws, all of these states are not in the South. New Hampshire, Vermont, uh, Rhode Island, these states have passed laws that are repressive, some suppressive, Georgia, nullification. Let's remember what King, King also told us, that people of ill will, in our society, seem to be making a better use of their time than the people of goodwill. And we got a good example of that on January 6th. We saw how effective people of ill will was using their time. Today, we have got a chance for the people of goodwill to make better use of their time. Because we are going to repent, as Dr. King said, not just for the vitriolic words and deeds of bad people, but for the fall and silence of good people. So the good people in this country need to break their silence and say 
there are two mansions, two cinema, two Romney, two Cassidy, and all these people that are carrying these false arguments. Let's break our silence and speak to them. Congressman Jim Clyburn, uh, always a pleasure, sir. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Okay, so great interview Craig Melvin did MSNBC with uh, Representative James Clyburn of South Carolina. James Clyburn is a former history teacher in high school. Uh, James Clyburn is a historian as well. Uh, so he understands his history. He was a member of SNCC, Student Nonviolent Coordinated Committee. And there's another interview he did on MSNBC where he talks about meeting Dr. King, goes in depth. We'll play that on tomorrow's show. Uh, but this uh, this interview, I've run out of patience. Representative James Clyburn on voting rights hold up. Um, so great. Uh, this, this is at MSNBC.com. OK, there was a uh, the rest of the stuff we have to get to tomorrow because we just um, it, it's so much. Um, letter from a Birmingham jail. You can read that at uh, uh, Stanford University's King Institute. And we had it up here on the screen. 1963, Dr. King was in jail in Birmingham, Alabama, 18, uh, April 16th, 1963, letter from a Birmingham jail. And um, the, uh, the body of King's letter called into question the clergy's charge of impatience on the part of the African-American community and of the extreme level of the campaign's actions, uh, white clergymen urge. For, and Dr. King said, for years now, I have, and, and why we can't wait, he said, for years now, I have heard the word wait. This wait has almost always meant never. Dr. King articulated the resentment felt when you are forever fighting a degenerating sense of nobodiness, then you will understand why we find it difficult to wait. Dr. King justified the tactic of civil disobedience by stating that just as the Bible Shadrach, Mesach, Me, uh, Mes, uh, Mesach and uh, Abednego refused to obey Nebuchadnezzar's unjust laws and colonists staged the Boston Tea Party, he refused to submit to laws and injunctions that were employed to uphold segregation and deny citizens their rights to peacefully assemble and protest. Dr. King also decried the inaction of whites, such as clergymen, such as the clergymen, charging that human progress, quote, comes through the tireless efforts of men willing to be co-workers with God. And without this hard work, time itself becomes an ally of the forces of social stagnation. And without this hard work, time itself becomes an ally to the forces of social stagnation. This is what Dr. Keene talked, uh, uh, wrote page 89 of Why We Can't Wait. Okay, his, his book, Why We Can't Wait, because he wrote five books. Okay, read the, read the rest of this uh, piece here. This deals with the letter from a letter from a Birmingham jail. Uh, this is at the King Institute uh, at Stanford University uh, on their website. All right. Now, um, let me see here. It was one other thing we'll squeeze in. Um, so the Senate, and we'll discuss this tomorrow. Uh, the Senate had the debate on the Senate floor today over the uh, Voting Rights Act. Uh, and the vote is going to take place, uh, it should take place Wednesday, Wednesday evening, about 6 p.m., 6.30 p.m., because they're going to put them on record on where you stand and put uh, Cinema and Mansion on record, put the 50 Republicans on record where you stand, okay? So there's no, there's no more running and hiding. And even if the vote fails, they should have to go on record on where they stand and we go from there, okay? And there needs to be uh, uh, massive protests along with targeted economic withdrawal strategies, especially against some of these corporations 
that donated to Cinema and Mansion and to these Republicans. And you have 16 Republicans, as we talked about on Sunday show, and go back and watch the Sunday show because the Sunday show is two hours. You have 16 Republicans who voted in 2006 to reauthorize the 1965 Voting Rights Act, but they're not voting for these Voting Rights Acts today. Yeah, 16 Republicans, in, including Mitch McConnell. Mitch McConnell in 2006 voted to reauthorize the Voting Rights Act. None of them are voting today. Susan Collins of Maine, old ass Chuck Grassley, who needs to retire out of Iowa, spineless Lindsey Graham out of South Carolina, Senator John Thune, Senator John Cornyn of Texas, Senator Marsha Blackburn of Tennessee, Senator Roy Blunt, who's retiring out of Missouri. At least he could do is do something right. OK, Senator Shelley Moore Capito, who's the other senator in West Virginia. And she's a Republican and West Virginia is a very red state. Donald Trump won West, West Virginia by 40 points in 2016 and 2020. Senator Richard Burr of North Carolina. OK, Senator uh, Jim Inhofe. These are 16 senators in the Senate right now. Who voted in 2006 to reauthorize the 1965 Voting Rights Act, but they're not voting for these Voting Rights Acts. Now, you can't say you can't say you support voting rights, but you're against the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act, and you're against the uh, Freedom to Vote Act, largely written by Joe Manchin. You can't say, yeah, we support voting rights. You can't tweet that you love Dr. King and John Lewis, but then you're going to vote against these bills and, and work to dismantle their legacies. OK, now. This piece here from The New York Post and is also an article from ABC News that deals with the activity in the Senate today. Uh, we are going on record, Senator, uh, Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer said. Uh, let me pull this up here. OK, we're uh, we're going on the record. We are going on the record. Schumer presses Mansion Cinema on moot filibuster vote. This is from January 18th, 2022. And they, they should have to go on the record. And then they should have to explain why they voted the way that they do. Why they voted the way that they did. And then we take action from there. So Senator Chuck Schumer is going to make his point, even if it's a moot one. The Democratic Senate uh, Senate Majority Leader from New York issued a stern warning, issued a stern warning to Republicans and defenders of the filibuster in his own party on Tuesday, saying, we are going to vote. We are all going on the record. Once members of the minority party have exhausted all of their speaking rights and defended their position, have, have uh, exhausted all of their speaking rights and defended their position on the Senate floor, the debate will run its course and the Senate will move to vote on final passage at a majority threshold, Senator Chuck Schumer added. If the Republican if the Republicans block, clo uh, block cloture, and let me flip over to this here, okay. If the Republicans block cloture on the legislation before us, I will put forward a proposal to change the rules to allow for a talking filibuster on this legislation. The Senate is now expected to vote on Wednesday on changes to the rules that would provide a workaround on the chamber's 60 vote legislative filibuster but the vote is almost certain to fall to fail due to centrist uh democrat senator joe manchin of west virginia and arizona's kirsten cinema uh starts opposition to changing the requirements much has been said over the past few days about the prospects of passing voter rights legislation in this chamber senator chuck schumer said Senate Democrats are under no illusion 
that we face difficult odds, especially when virtually every Senate Republican, virtually every Senate Republican is staunchly against legislation protecting the right to vote. But uh, what I want to be clear, when this chamber confronts a question this important, one so vital to our country, so vital to our ideas, so vital to the future of our democracy, you don't slide it off the table and say, never mind. Now, in response to this, Moscow Mitch McConnell, who tweeted about Dr. King on Dr. King Day, but is working to dismantle Dr. King and John in John Lewis's legacy, Mitch McConnell in response pointed out that the city vote filibuster was used by Democrats to defeat a Russia sanctions bill pushed by Senator Ted Cruz. But he, but uh, Mitch McConnell changed the filibuster rule and, and did, did a workaround to the filibuster to get uh, federal judges passed and Supreme Court judges passed also confirmed. Democrats want the American people to believe the filibuster was not a Jim Crow relic in 2005, was not a Jim Crow relic in 2020, became a Jim Crow relic in 2021, briefly stopped being the Jim Crow relic last Tuesday, but is now back to being a Jim Crow relic this week. McConnell mocked he went on to call the legislation a partisan takeover of the election system. Now, what's a partisan takeover? It's what's taking place at the state at the state level with these voter suppression bills. These bills here are working to restore Section 4 of the Voting Rights Act that, that was weakened because of Shelby County versus Holder, U.S. the uh, U.S. Supreme Court case of 2013. McConnell goes on to say, "We have inflation, a pandemic." rampant violent crime, a border crisis, and the possibility of a war on the European continent. But rather than work on any of that, Senate Democrats want to mar, mar their own legacies with a reckless procedural vote they know will fail. So you can read the rest of this here. This is after McConnell tweeted about Dr. King and Dr. King's words and all this stuff and his legacy, all that BS. Okay, so uh, read the rest of this article here. We are going on the record. Schumer Prance, uh, presses mansion and cinema on moot filibuster vote. January 18, 2022 uh, from the New York Post. NewYorkPost.com. All right. Um, the rest of the stuff we'll get to tomorrow and uh, tomorrow's show. I'll play an excerpt of the presentation that I gave uh, today. Be sure to read the uh, article that I wrote. Why did Dr. King tell us to redistribute the pain, understanding the power of economic withdrawal? Uh, and we posted that on our Facebook fan page, also the African History Network. I'm, I'm going to I'm going to put it on the home page of um, our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. Be sure to read this here, okay? Uh, this article, and I'll post I'll post the link here on the thread because I get deep into this history and uh, targeted sustained economic withdrawal strategies. All right, be sure to, uh, you can, we have the uh, lecture uh, that I did a few years ago, uh, it's two and a half hours dealing with uh, the distortion of uh, Dr. King's legacy, the distortion of the legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., the revolutionary, will not be televised on the television. So that's available right now. We have it on the homepage of our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. Uh, it's in digital download format and uh, DVD format. Digital download is $8. DVD format is um, $10. It's a two and a half hour presentation. So I get deep into this history. Post the link here again.
All right, let me see here. You can also register for the online courses I teach on Saturdays and Sundays as well. The distortion of the legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. revolutionary will not be televised on the television. So we do with the revolutionary Dr. King that uh, you won't see uh, oftentimes on Dr. King Day, especially in mainstream media. All right, look, we have to get out of here. Um, if you want to advertise with the African History Network, uh, email us at ahnshow at africanhistorynetwork.com, ahnshow at africanhistorynetwork.com. Current promotion for very limited time only is buy one month, get two months free. We have uh, three new advertising packages also. So we have the information on the homepage of our website. All right, we have to get out of here. Remember, uh, at the African History Network, we focus on educating, empowering, and inspiring people of African descent throughout the diaspora and around the world. Because right now it's correct wrong behavior. It's not over till we win. We're kind of forever. And uh, we'll talk to you tomorrow. Peace. What does self-care mean to you? To us, it's an opportunity to reconnect with nature. A chance to create something remarkable. At Sage and Elm Apothecary, our handcrafted skin care and household products immerse you in Earth's sweetest nectar, connecting you to nature in a way you never imagined. See for yourself and visit us at sageandelmapothecary.com. iRedify is a Black-owned digital platform that showcases Black and Brown cultures and people. The books on the platform are written by African-American authors, Afro-Caribbean authors, African authors, and so much more. Kids 14 and under can read ebooks, listen to audiobooks, and complete learning activities. Kids can even write in the books digitally. Get unlimited access to everything on the platform for only $8.99 a month at iRedify.com. Sign up for your membership today. Mental health and well-being have long been a taboo subject in the so-called African-American community. So I enlisted the help of mental health experts, thought leaders, and activists to help kill the ghost of Willie Lynch and heal from post-traumatic slave syndrome. We experience trauma a lot of times um, on a subconscious level. So sometimes something happens to us and we know that it's traumatizing, but we don't really recognize the extent of the trauma. Black on Purpose Television Network. Yes, Black on Purpose Television Network. All black, all positive, all the time. The largest Black-owned streaming television network in the world. Bringing our people together worldwide. Controlling our messages, our story, our way. Black TV the way it should be. Black music, Black history, and more. 30 plus channels, thousands of shows. Black on Purpose Television Network. Subscribe now. The work that I do is larger than the fashion industry. It's larger than the art world. And I believe that I was born to bring newness into this world. I'm Kaima McIntyre. I'm 24 years old and I'm an artist. I create everything from paintings to jewelry design, metaphysical jewelry to be specific, and fashion design. The only reason why my prom dress went viral is because people needed it. Within a few days of going viral, Notori Naughton reached out to me and she's like, I saw your dress, can you make me a dress? I was equally as shocked to be asked by a celebrity to design their dress at the age of 17. That's just one person and the list just continues to go on to Janet Jackson, to Tyra Banks. It really hits home. That means that the discussion is happening on the grounds in real time. Soul in Motion, celebrating 38 years in the arts. This energetic ensemble of dancers and drummers was started by percussionist Michael Friend and is led by choreographer, associate director Pam Lassiter. 
Based in the Washington, D.C. area, Soul in Motion is now accepting bookings for Black History Month, Juneteenth, and summer festivals in 2022. Soul in Motion is also available for more intimate events like naming ceremonies and weddings. To find out more or book your date, call 240-452-1349 or send an email to info at soulinmotion.org. Be sure to check us out on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. Soul in Motion, celebrating our history, our culture, our future. Soul